in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here tonight and learn about your great witness, Mother Teresa. May we see her virtue as uh, something to strive for in our own life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so tonight we're going to kind of brush on three things. A little bit about Mother Teresa's life. Um, um, and we're going to hit some of the high points and key events in her life and try to explain some misconceptions of her life. Uh, we'll then try to pull out like main themes in her life and how they relate to us. We'll probably do that towards the end. And then we're going to go over the canonization process and use her process as a, an example to follow along. And so basically how someone becomes a saint after they die. And um, yeah, so um, my name's Eric Dito. I think most of you have one knows me. I have three kids at Yale. Um, um, but I teach RCIA, and the only reason why I bring that up is uh, when, when I teach those classes, we allow people to ask questions at any moment. And so if you misheard something or anything, raise your hand. It's not going to cause me to lose track or anything like that. I'm used to it. And that's the only, all right? Um, so uh, I, we have a couple of handouts. This is just a very, like, a nice graphic I saw that basically goes over a lot of what we'll go over today. Uh, this is a, is a nice summary put out by the Vatican on uh, Mother Teresa's life. It was read right at her beatification. And then this uh, on Friday, we'll be showing the movie The Letters here at the cathedral. Um, so if y'all want to come, um, yeah. Okay. All right, so Mother Teresa actually has a pretty big effect in my life, just to start off. So this little book that one of y'all could get um, was probably uh, when I went to college, I actually went to Texas State. I was studying to be a math teacher slash athletic trainer. And so I was saying that, and I read this book um, and some other books, but th this is one of the spiritual books that I read, and it really was one of the things that convinced me, you know, I, I'm going to change my career and go learn theology and serve the church. So, um, uh, and, and it's one of her key themes is total surrender commitment to Jesus no matter what. And so uh, these little books, Mother Teresa didn't write books. She just wrote letters and excerpts. So what these little books do is they take major themes and they, uh, and they try to compile her writings under th these themes. So um, just a little bit about that. Uh, so Mother, Mother Teresa, so, uh, so she was born in August 26, 1910, and this town called Skopje. It was Albania then, so this is the closest time I could get with the Ottoman Empire, and so, and that all fell with World War II. But we won't go into the history there. It's now a part of Macedonia, presently. Um, so she grew up there. She had three. Uh, her name is Agnes. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because I'm just in a boot trip because, yeah. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that her middle name meant Little Flower because she took on Teresa of Lisieux, the Little Flower, as her name when she took her first vows. 
I thought that was interesting. So she was uh, um, the youngest of three siblings. Her father died when she was at the age of eight. Uh, and uh, so her mom raised her, and despite only being uh, a single parent, her mother had this deep love of serving the poor. So she would actually invite people to her house to eat with them. It was this great witness that her mother gave. And so, uh, so she always had this uh, example of her mother living and loving the poor. And by the age of 13, she had this commitment of serving and being a missionary. She always had this love for mission. Anyway, so by the time she was 18, she joined the Loretto sisters in Iowa. And the reason why she joined them is she had uh, heard that they had a, the, the Jesuit parish that she was a part of. Um, um, they had missionaries, which was about the age of 17, that came and told her trips down in Bengali, India, and how they taught there. And so he knew that these Loretto sisters had a, uh, a school down in India. So she went up there. The, the founder is an English woman who actually formed the order down in India when um, the English were basically taking over India. And kind of, yeah, I don't know how you want to define what they were doing. Yeah. What? No, no, it, it wasn't a Jesuit. Where she was at, at her home parish, was a Jesuit priest. And he referred her to this, the Loretto sisters, where St. Mary's in Calcutta was, was run by these Loretto sisters. That's not really, they actually have an institute of, we're not thinking of, they're usually just referred to as the Loretto sisters. So. She joined in 1920, took the name Mary Teresa after um, Teresa of Lisieux, and that's what, what, why we call it now, Mother Teresa. So, at the, so she then traveled. So this is going to be kind of hard. To, so this town Benjili, India, is up here, in this north part of India. And there actually is up in this, is actually the Himalayas. And so she spends a couple of time in Dublin, learns English, and then heads down to Darjeeling, India. Uh, she finally made her first vows, and that's uh, really important when people join the religious life, they make first vows, and they're, they're temporary vows for a year. And so it's kind of like a, uh, see, I, I'm not good with technical terms, but it's kind of like a trial year. You're, you're vowing to live this life for one year. And you make another one year vow, another one year vow, then a three year vow. And then you're finally vows for the rest of your life. Death to you. Yeah. So she made her first vows in 1931. Uh, there she starts teaching at the school of St. Mary's. Um, she taught ge geography and history and then also catechism. But I think this is really neat because everyone always thinks, oh, she's religious. She must just teach religious, religious things. But she didn't. But she actually taught a very secular thing, which is geography and history. And you can do a lot of great good just by doing secular things. Um, but the school in Calcutta where St. Mary's was, uh, so just going back to the to the map. So here's Calcutta. This is where Darwin Jing is up here. So, um, the school mostly served wealthy uh, girls, family girls from wealthy families. Uh, the town in Calcutta then was mostly a Hindu population, 
with uh, when Hinduism and then Muslims and then the minority was Catholics. So um, Catholics were very few in between. So kind of kind of like us here, but we're not around. Um, we're surrounded by Christians. So, uh, so it's a little bit different. But she was really successful. She became principal in 1944. Um, but during this time, some key things happened. So this is, and this, because like we hear about the poor, so like what, what about the poor? So there's two key things. The, the Bengali famine, which happened in 1943, this happened do, during the World War II, because India was occupied by the British. And so we all know the, the Pacific Front and what was happening was the they had a couple of years in 1940 and 1941 where there was uh, uh, bad crop production and then uh, after that with the war they needed food and they were taking it from the Indian colonies to survive in it and so they, they didn't have that much food the British were taking it and so it led to mil millions of people dying. And they literally just died on the street. And so then after that, the people in India um, uh, tried to fight for their independence. And they broke away from the British. But there was a conflict after that of, of the Hindus and Muslims. And so it's called the Calcutta Riots. And they happened from 16, August 16th to 20th. And they say about seven to 10,000 people died. And if you watch the letters that show, they kind of reference these mobs coming in. And, but, but the key thing about this is these two men were so huge. And there's, there's uh, this starvation and then these riots. That, and these are actual pictures. They said the, the bodies were just left out to rot. And so people would have to, because they, they would just hear, they would just smell the flesh of people rotting. And so um, I, I always, it's just to put on the backdrop of what, is actu what was actually happening. So she saw this from this convent where she was serving the wealthy, she could look out and just see what was happening in Calcutta. So what happened was in 1996, she takes this retreat back to Donjiling. Um, and at this um, trip up on the train, um, it's always referred as the call within the call. And so it's where, we learned later on she was having, she was receiving visions or, uh, or um, like an audible um, calls from Jesus to serve the poor, to serve these people that were that were dying. And so, upon that, she comes back and asks to be removed from the Loretto sisters. Now, the, the interesting thing is this happened in 1946, but she didn't leave until 1948. And I think this is really neat because you see the great um, obedience that Mother Teresa had. Because she asked um, part of her convent, uh, her vows was to be to stay within the convent. Of uh, it wasn't stability, but that's similar to it. Um, so she would have to be released from her vows uh, um, to the Loretto sisters. And so that takes a petition process, and it lasted two years. And so she was obedient to the vows that she kept um, until being released. Uh, by them. And from that, she went out into the slums. 
as they were referred to. She took a white, wore a white sarai with a blue border, which wasn't like your traditional nun habit. Um, is actually what Hindus and Muslims would wear. And, and it was to be with the people. Because you have to understand, like, she's the minority. Like they, um, so she took on that, and before she actually went into the slums, she went to a hospital, and I forgot the, the, the name, for, th for three months run by the Sisters of the Poor to actually learn medical training, which I thought was like, uh, like she realized, okay, I'm not equipped to do this. I need to get training, and then they can go out and really help these people, which I thought was just a very good practical <laughs> Thing. Like, it wasn't just an irrational decision. I want to go and go help the people. Like, uh. So, she starts out going out into the slums where she just began to, because she was a natural teacher, she first takes care of people. But then, around five uh, children, uh, and began to teach them. What happened was people were, were hearing what she did, and some of her former students joined her, and this is kind of how her movement grew. And it was actually kind of scandalous, because you have to think, these girls, her former students, come from very well, wealthy families. They're very well educated, and they're choosing to go work in the swamp. And so um, there was some conflict with their parents and all that. Uh, but uh, fr from that, they, they formed the, the religious order uh, and ask, asking the permission of the bishop and that whole process of forming a religious order. Uh, after that, in two years, they formed this house, which used to be a Hindu temple um, for the house of the dying. And I want to read, because this does get to uh, a key thing about Mother Teresa's uh, life. So this is just an excerpt from the, the first person she cared for that was dying. Because the, the thing, this house for the dying was not a hospital. It was for basically people that, because if you remember, there were people just left on the streets to die. And basically her, her thought was um, a beautiful death is for people who live like animals, so these are those people on the street, to die like angels loved and wanted. And basically every person deserves to die as a human and not just on the feet. So just to um, realize kind of what type of individual. The first person uh, Teresa cared for was a woman who she found half eaten by rats and ants lying in the street. She took her to the hospital and was told that there was nothing that could be done for her. And she stayed at her side until she died. I think that was the thing that you see greatly is that he, even though they're dying, just to be with them. And, and it really is, this is a, the remarkable thing about um, Mother Teresa is you see this love that she has for people that are lonely, to be with them while they're dying. And the remarkable thing is, and I, I forgot to go over this, when she left her family to join the Loretto sisters, she never saw her mother again. It was incredible. So she literally left. Then when she left her Loretto sisters, that was one of the first things that she dealt with, this, this sense of just being lonely. Because you have to think, she was with these sisters, and, this, and now she's by herself. And, and this choice to live this life of loneliness but also this choice to help all these people who are in just lonely. So I, I always 
found that very interesting. So th this is the actual house her mom her died. Um, it's a house of peace. Well, Eric, I didn't yeah. get that house. Um, so basically it was an old Hindu temple that was abandoned and the, um, the state just gave it to her because no one was using it. Uh, yeah, it was. But again, I think the the key is it, w it wasn't like a, a like a hospital, it was just for people to to die. Um, it's almost like our, our modern day hospital. hospice. Hospice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a really neat thing because when you think of compassion, like what is compassion will come is to be with and passion of suffer suffer with someone. Um, and then from that she opened a house for leopards. Um, oh sorry, that was called the city of peace. And then a home for orphans and homeless. And uh, I bring up all these things because a lot of times we don't hear of her early life, um, where this is just her and those, uh, t uh, yes, I have 12 people to start an order, but the, uh, this is kind of the groundbreaking right there at Calcutta. Just, okay, we see a problem, okay, let's try to find the best way to help these people. And then from that, these are all the br branches, orders that, that come from it. So the missionaries of charity, brothers, so again, basically men taking on vows to live this, but they aren't ordained. And then the contemplative branch, so contemplatives staying closed and pray, so they're not out. And then again with brothers, and then you have the missionary charity of fathers, and then the lay missionaries were founded the same e year. And so we actually, there's an actual uh, group of lay missionaries from Dallas. And uh, so w w one of the lay, mis a lay missionary charity lives here. And so afterwards we'll, we'll go, and she was able to allow us to borrow a first class relic of Mother Teresa, and we have that in room three set up for y'all to venerate after uh, uh, class. And we'll go over like how to properly venerate and all of that. But so um, there are, so if you ever feel inspired, there are lay missionaries at charity. Yeah. We'll go over that at the end. Yeah. Remind me, but first class relic is a body part. It's her hair. Okay. And then uh, she had her first real, like, um, I'm not going to go over all, all her life. She, most people know she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. She received multiple awards, basically starting in 1976 is when people became aware of what she was doing, and the order began to spread. Um, it actually first started, they asked her to uh, s send a, a group, first it spread across India, and then they sent the order to Brazil, and it started in South, um, South America, and then it moved up into like the Europe and Brazil, uh, and Russia, Asia. I mean, India is part of Asia, but yeah. Um, and then finally over to the America, North America. But uh, by the 19, 1987, she had her first heart attack. She had another one in 19, um, uh, 1989, 1987. And so that's when her health began to deteriorate. deteriorate. And she finally, which I find amazing, she finally stepped down in March 
of the year that she died. I mean, that's crazy. So she was uh, uh, in charge of this entire um, uh, thing. When she died, they had uh, 4,000 uh, 4, 4, nuns stationed throughout the entire world, um, which is quite <coughs> remarkable of how fast it grew. And then she died on September 5th, 1997. So this is her tomb. Um, and it's interesting if you, if, uh, if you like just Google the tomb of, of, of Mother Teresa, they put like on, the, it's, it's just a white tomb on top of it. You'll find different, uh, uh, sayings of hers that, that they put in flowers and they must like rotate it often but um, so say like I thirst or yeah so th th there's no set uh, saying that they have on there that's the main thing I wanted to that's in yeah yeah it's in uh, yeah, it's in India in the mother house So some key ideas, and I find this one, so the great value of human life. Uh, so I see God in every human being. When I wash the leopard's wound, I feel I am nursing the Lord himself. Is it not a beautiful experience? And just seeing Jesus and, and everyone, and, and it's quite remarkable because um, she, she saw, she truly saw that all people are equal. So, and we first think, oh, well, um, because she saw the person dying on the street was just as equal as the person that she was teaching in her classroom. But no one was helping the person die on the street, so she went out there. But the other interesting thing that I find is most of the people that were dying, they weren't Catholics. They were just Hindus. And like it didn't matter, there's no qualification. Oh, well, well, you're a Christian, okay, well, we're gonna bump you up in the ranks of who we need to help. No, she just saw the people as people. I think that because a lot of times uh, we like to categorize people and say, oh, well, these, but no, all people are equal. And she saw the great dignity of, of each person because um, she saw Christ in them. And so I find that very beautiful. Um, the other one is this commitment to Jesus. Uh, so, and I always love this quote, but we're called we're called upon not to be successful, but to be faithful. Because uh, I know a lot of times we may feel like we're failing in something, but we're just called to be faithful in what we do. And this goes up, if you'll remember, I think it was about eight, eight or nine years ago when her letters were, were released and people heard, oh, she was doubting Jesus ever loved her. And she she must have not have been a Christian, or I mean, you heard like all kinds of crazy things from that. But what what we found out was this this loneliness that she experienced was not just of that of being away from her family or her sisters, but f from God. And you may be like, what the heck does that mean? Um, and so it's referred to as the dark night of the soul. And so um, the best way to explain this is, so um, I'm going to use the analogy of like a relationship. So, and then I love my wife. My wife knows it, so I always use our, our relationship. So when I first met my wife and she met me, there was this affection towards each other where we have them in the nice warm fuzzies and all of that. 
And, and usually with our conversion towards God, we receive that also. They're called, um, gosh, con, consolations. Thank you. Uh, consolations. So we're being affirmed in this. But like all marriages, um, of, um, that kind of slowly, uh, no, I'm not saying like I don't find my wife attractive or anything like that, but um, that slowly uh, lessens, but it doesn't mean that you don't love someone because affection is not love. Love is a choice. I choose what is best for my wife and my children. That's love. And so the same is um, so, uh, an example is like when my wife and I had our first daughter. She it was beautiful, she's crying, yeah, she's cute, that's why you got mixed cute babies. But like when she wakes up at night, I don't feel any of that. Like I'm usually <laughs> tired, I'm angry, I don't want to wake up. But like I don't just say, oh, well, since I don't feel anything. To hell with that child, she'll get, no, I'll go and I have to change the diapers and then get messy, cause, yeah, because I love her, like, so emotions don't have to be, so that's really, it's called the, um, the, the for like it's the darkness of the senses, so the same happens with God, so first, uh, our relationship with God, it's all, warm and fuzzy, and a lot of people refer as coming down the mountain, and that kind of leaves. Um, but just like our, in our human relationship, that doesn't mean that we don't love God. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. And so uh, people also refer to this as like dryness and prayer. Prayer doesn't, you may not be getting warm and fuzzies from prayer, but that doesn't mean, oh, well, I'm going to reject prayer. No, you, you still must be persistent. So most people have, ex have experienced that. But that's, that's not referred to. When you're not experiencing the dark night of soul. The dark night of soul is something even deeper where, where um, the, the, ex the experience of even uh, of, of feeling God or knowing he's there is, is taken away. And, and the, 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 the interesting thing about that is, um, why would God do that? Um, like, what, what, what's happening there? So a, a, a good thing, again, when we have to relate to children, so when I'm trying to ch teach my child to do something, um, so we're just going to go with potty training. Uh, so you want your child to, do, to go to the restroom. So if she goes to the restroom on the potty, what do you do? You reward her. Give her like some M&Ms. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So, and you're trying to entice a proper behavior. Well, eventually you begin to remove those M&Ms because this is just something you're supposed to do. Like, uh, so when my daughter's in middle school, I don't need to get a phone call from the principal. She went to the restroom. Okay, I'll be over there, make sure to give her m and &M. No, that's something that you're expected to do. And so the, the, the same, uh, it's almost like a challenge. Um, and so you, you see, God, God, because God wants us to seek Him for His sake and not for the warm and fuzzies. So those warm and fuzzies are, to, are slowly taken away so that we can seek Him, so that we're committed to Him and not the warm and fuzzies. And so it's not like the warm and fuzzies never come. It's, it's kind of like an ebb and flow. But um, it, it, with that backdrop, we can now understand like, what she was going through lasted years. And it's amazing like her commitment 
to to that to like well no I'm gonna keep going I said, why because I am committed to Jesus Christ and it's, it's a proud it's a profound witness that she gives to us because usually I, like me I mean oh man I'm not praying what am I doing oh no this is for I'm gonna just give up like that. That, that's usually what I have to go through. Uh, yeah, I mean, she, from, uh, from uh, a lot of what I've heard, like, she experienced that for like 40 years, which is remarkable. Like, yeah, and just continue to continue. Yeah. I thought that um, at one point her, her spiritual director, that priest, I think he was from Ireland or whatever, one that you would write to yeah. broke through that whole dark night by saying actually what you are experiencing um, that that is God that is he has not disappeared yeah. that is it and then that at least the books I've read that switched her into a whole other thing um, other than is it that she event I mean my understanding yeah. is she did move out of the dark night uh, again uh, I want to take uh, I haven't read that much probably than you have, so good. Um, the the next thing the, I think was interesting is so you all see the the phrase like I thirst her interpretation of like what Christ meant on the cross when he said I thirst. I think it gets to kind of like the, the true um, thing that kept her going. So th this is a quote, at the most difficult time, and so this is her referring to Jesus, he proclaimed, I thirst, and the people thought he was thirsty in an ordinary way, and they gave him vinegar straight away. But it was not for, for that thirst, it was for our love, for our affection, that intimate attachment to him, and that sharing of his passion. He used I thirst instead of give me your love. I thirst, let us hear him saying it to me and saying it to you. I think it's, it's a really profound thing of, of understanding what he, what, one, how much God loves us and how much he wants to um, be loved by us. And this profound love that he has, and uh, and you can see that, like to to take care of someone that's being eaten by animals and dying, you have to have this great love. That I know Jesus loves that person too, and I'm going to express that same love to them. And so just understanding how much God loves all of us and just also ourselves because I, I know that's one thing that sorry when I teach her everyone basically finds out all about my struggles um, but like uh, of easily falling into despair of, well no how could Jesus love me for all the things I've done well no no, no matter what I always should know Jesus does love me and he not only loves me greatly, he loves everyone else. And so, uh, um, yeah. Um, are there any questions about? No. So I want to go over the canonization process real quick. Uh, sorry. I have like some throat thing, so yeah. Um, so, the thing that I find interesting about, about the canonization process, the process that were, that happened and is happening right now, didn't go into to the effect until 1983. So, just a little bit about how saints became canonized. Um, first, like the idea of someone, um, someone that should be venerated and acknowledged in heaven. First came from the idea of like 
martyrs to someone that was a martyr is a witness, someone that dies put, um, living the faith. And so you can see this in the early church writings, like when Parley Carp is martyred, he's burnt. And then after um, the, the fame, flames reside, all the people come to, the Christians come to take his bones into the catacombs. So, um, and you can see the catacombs in Rome. So the idea of preserving the, the bones of the martyrs and, and honoring them. And it wasn't really until like the fourth century, so the idea of not just m martyrs, but what it's called confessors. So people that, that didn't die for the faith, but through their life was a witness and confession, or a confession a um, of Christ's life living in them. And so uh, that happened, what, what, would, what would happen, it would be more diocesan. Was it like a real universal project? So the bishop would oversee, so someone that, that was either a martyr or was a great, lived a great life, um, the issue would be brought up and the bishop would either delegate it or himself investigate, okay, was it a true martyrdom or did this person live a true life of, um, of virtue? And then that area would celebrate their life. So it wasn't as, uh, we do see like some examples of martyrs put into the Roman canon. So there was a sense of some universal, but most of it was very uh, local. Uh, and it didn't become more universal, more affirmed, like the, the Pope needs to make a de declaration until about the 8th or 9th century. Um, uh, and then from that, uh, uh, it became more and more organized until now. Uh, Pope John Paul II issued this apostolic constitution and then this congregation, which is part of the Roman Cura and the Vatican, then issued the new laws of the causes of saints. And that's kind of what we're going to go over uh, today. So these are kind of the tie, the titles are kind of the steps. So first someone's declared a servant of God, then a venerable, then a blessed, and then a saint, and they're canonized. Um, and so for a blessed, there must be a miracle that um, vow or, um, affirms it, and also again for them to be canonized. And you may be like, well, why do we need a miracle? So to go over like, what is a saint? A saint is someone that's in heaven. Like we know they're in heaven. So if they're in heaven, they can intercede of us, for us because we're not the God of the dead, we're the God of the living. So we don't die when we're in heaven. We can participate um, um, in the church. And so people in heaven can intercede or pray on our behalf. And so it, it actually is very, I hate to use but it's very much like the scientific method. So we find people that live a very saintly life. We make a hypothesis that, hey, they might be in heaven. And so we investigate that. And then our experiments are, well, let's ask them to intercede for us, and we should see proof, which is a miracle that they're in heaven. Like it's, and we actually, so. It's quite, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It can't be like happenstance, okay. and we'll go over like the requirements of what is a valid miracle. I mean, so it can't be like, oh man, you know, my throat kind of hurts right now. Um, Fulton John the Sheen, Venerable um, Fulton, 
you're on chin. Cure my throat, and then like the next day my throat feels better. Oh, that's a valid miracle. Well, no, um, the church requires a little bit more than that. <laughs> Actually, a lot more than that. But, <laughs> but okay, so it starts at the diocesan level. So usually there's a five-year waiting period. So what, uh, what kind of like let the dust settle? Because the church wants to make sure like there's nothing that people don't know about. Um, and then what happens is after cause is actually people locally basically begin to collect things, so documents, anything, and bring it to the bishop and say, we think this person, they basically make a petition and say, we think this person lived a great life of virtue. Um, from then, the bishop will uh, set kind of the tribunal to begin to investigate even more and collect testimony. All um, writings of the person are collected, so published or unpublished, or if there's journals, um, like the, the lay uh, missionary of charity that I talked to um, um, today, uh, she said when they were investigating Mother Teresa's life, all the letters that she wrote her, she had to send back to the Vatican, because uh, that was kind of in the later stage, but they want all written documents from that person to make sure basically everything that they said was in line with the church and that their wives were living in accordance with the church. Um, then the bishop will ask, uh, for the the Roman Cure section, the Congregation of the Cause of Canonization, to begin the proper investigation, and a prosecutor is appointed to oversee it. So that's usually someone in the diocesan level, or if it's a religious order, an individual that's part of the order who will oversee the entire process. And so uh, this is the main thing that they're looking for, heroic virtue um, and devout life. So after that, um, after the diocese has, has collected everything, the bishop basically uh, approves it and then sends the entire document, which is called the, the, posis, the position paper, positio to the congregation, and then they uh, have nine theologians that look over it, and they vote on it. Um, they can also ask for more documentation. Um, then they send it to the main cardinals and bishops, and they approve it, and then the Holy Father approves it, and then finally after that, they will decree the individual as a venerable. So it's a, it's a pretty lengthy process. So with Mother Teresa, she died in uh, September 1997. The bishop asked for a request from that five years, which was granted. Um, this is the priest, Father Kulu. Again, I might even try to pronounce the name. Um, who's the um, postulate? to oversee the entire process. Um, the diocese uh, was done in 2001. Then it was sent to the congregation, uh, and they approved it within two years and declared her a venerable on December 2002. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you can look at, I mean, look at the, how many, oh, that's supposed to be S. But 35,000 page document about her life. So it's pretty well investigation into her life. So once someone is called the venerable, there is basically said that they have been found with heroic virtue. Um, no feast day, no churches are built. Um, they're not saying that they're in heaven. 
who is saying they live the life of virtue. Um, yeah. Uh, but holy cards can be made. Uh, and then from there, they can be either beatified as a confessor or a martyr. And so uh, a confessor needs a miracle to be beatified. If someone's martyred, there's a separate investigation on that. And then if, they, if it's proved that they were martyred, then they're made a blessed and a first miracle is not required. So what makes a miracle? So the individual has to be sick. There has to be no known cure or um, prayers must be directed to the venerable. And then the patient is cured. It has to be spontaneous, complete, lasting. Uh, and doctors have to um, find no other explanation. So other types are called the inc can be miracles after the saint's wife reluctant to them. So um, they can be incorruptible. So this is Saint Catherine of Siena's head. It was not mummified or embalmed. So um, her head's in Spain. Her body's in Rome. We do crazy things like that as Catholics. Um, <laughs> Whoops, uh, liquefaction, so you can look at St. Genarius. This is, his blood is placed, it's dried up in this little, I guess this would be referred as like a reliquary. And then um, on his feast days and some other days, it becomes liquefied. And the crazy thing is, it, is it doesn't matter like the temperature of the room or anything like that. So they can't explain oh, well, the temperature's got, because it's happened in 76 degrees and like low 60s. Um, yeah, and then the order of sanctity is usually sometimes connected with um, incorruptibles, but with uh, St. Teresa of Avila, part of the uh, investigation process on the um, venerable size, they will sometimes dig up the body um, to uh, extract relics, uh, and if they dig it up, like when they dig up St. Teresa of Avila, they smell this great fragrance, so there's no sign of decay, and then the body was actually left there. So that's another uh, acceptable miracle. Others it can be doing their life, so levitation, uh, floating while in prayer, or stigmata or bilocation, which happened with Padre Bio, so the wounds of Christ will um, become bearing on the individual's hands and feet. So this is a picture of Padre Bio, um, who had stigmata. Um, people, St. Francis, some people think uh, St. Paul, he's talking about bearing the wounds of Christ. People don't know if it's physical or metaphorical, and then uh, by locations, people reporting someone in two places at the same time. So those are miracles that can account, happen in, during the person's life, that can also count. So um, with Mother Teresa, it was this uh, little Monica, she had a tumor in her stomach, um, and two nuns, so this is an interesting thing. She didn't ask for it, but two nuns took um, basically a, a medallion with Mother Teresa's uh, picture. So in the year after her death, this woman was in the hospital, they placed it on the woman's stomach, and when the, when the doctor came back, the tumor was gone. And so now the crazy thing is, you can see the investigation. This happened in 1998, and it was finally approved in 2002. So it's a, a lengthy looking in, doctors have to affirm it. And then, so that was her first miracle, and she became beatified on October 19, 2003. So she was a blessed. So blessed is someone, um, 
that the church says is worthy of belief. So we believe that they are in heaven. Good. And so, like I said, the beatified either as a confessor or a martyr, a feast day is assigned to them, and that feast day is usually the day of their death. Why would that be? What? Well, yeah. Yeah, so it was the beginning of this new life with Christ in heaven. Um, so that feast day can be celebrated in their home diocese or within the religious order. So like the, uh, um, yeah, but not like universally. Uh, churches can begin to be named. So this is St. Kateri. She's now a saint uh, in 2012, but she was a blessed. This is actual church in Buffalo here. And it was built in 1979. So she was a blessed then. So she's now a saint. So we did have a saint, a church named after a blessed. Um, and I see. So then the next uh, miracle, I couldn't find this guy's name. Like this is the one thing that I could, the other woman I could find a ton on. But it was just a Brazilian man who was 35. He was a mechanical engineer. The only thing that uh, uh, makes that interesting is at the end of his life, right after the, the miracle, he went back straight to the job. So he had a, a, a brain infection, which caused eight tumors to um, develop and obsess. Uh, and it, they had to induce him into a coma. And so, uh, on December 9th, 2008, they were gonna bring him into like a last attempt surgery and something happened in the hospital which delayed the procedure and during that delay, the priest and his wife went to the chapel and asked Mother Teresa to intercede. And when the surgeon came back, the man was sitting up and wondering where he was. So, and they did another MRI. There was no tumor. It was all gone. Uh, yeah, and so that happened in 2008. And so you can see it was just last year when they finally, uh, I, I know this is a canonization date, but it was uh, last year in, uh, I believe, October when they finally affirmed it. So again, it took a pretty lengthy process. So. The, uh, again, th th there's one thing I, I think is always neat because a lot of times we feel like, oh, but miracles don't happen. Well, no, miracles do happen. And the church is very um, specific to make sure that a miracle is a supernatural event. Like, it's not a natural event that we then say, well, God did it. No, we, we have to find that, oh, no, there's no natural cause. God must have acted. Yeah. So once someone's canonized, they're put in the actual, um, it's, a, it's a statement of infallibility upon the church that that individual is in heaven. Um, and so that makes sense because we just affirmed it by two miracles. Um, and so the feast day can be celebrated universally. So. Um, yeah, and so they're added into into the actual. You know, I forgot the term. You know, my the the or the. Well, I forgot. And, well, 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 when they're put in the actual, it's not the lectionary, but the actual, the order. Yeah, and so. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know these Catholic. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah. So that's a good. 
So I think um, a, a good like uh, uh, what Ms. says is so usually when anyone dies in, in the liturgy of the church, the first thing that we do within the funeral rite is we pray for their soul, assuming that they're in purgatory. So, so that's our first assumption. And so we're going to pray for their soul. We're not going to make any judgment. We're hoping for the best, that, they, that they're in purgatory. And so we don't even like, assume that something, someone went to hell. We always assume the best, and we pray for their soul in purgatory. And so um, the, uh, if you want to say, like, the, who would the church, like, refer people to actually, for you to, to seek their intercession, you, you may want to refer to, like, people that have been declared servants of God, because that's the least, but if you're saying, like, the actual church body, well, the church body has done investigation on these people and uh, have found them worthy of heroic virtue and therefore people can ask for their intercession. So that's, if you're going to say like the church, but, uh, but I think the, the key thing when looking at the, the saints is so much, so much of this is done the beginning stages are done at the local level. And so like, uh, uh, if, uh, if someone is found of heroic virtue, that, that whole process begins at the local level and local people have to promote and state that they are, now, now if it's a family member, um, uh, yeah. My grandmother, was a holy. Pray to your grandmother that she prays for you in heaven. Yeah. 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 Or even like a venerable, because a venerable needs a um, needs a miracle. It's usually done on the local level too. But yeah, so that that's one thing I always. Yeah, I know this is. But if you're seeking miracles, hop on the website, Google venerables and blesseds, and and begin a devotion. Try to find one that. That, that's connected to your call. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But, but I mean, the uh, interesting book is if you do any reading on um, Father, oh gosh, I forgot his first name, uh, Chap, Chapin. He was a Kansas priest that went Kapon. Yeah, from uh, who went to Vietnam. I mean, there's an actual book about his. That was in Korea. What? He was Korea. Korea, Korea sorry. Um, but, but do you know the book that, that it's basically the newspaper covered his, some of his canonization process? I, I, um, but, but that's another good book to read about because a lot of it was very local people around the parish that. He um, that he grew um, for sure, and then his war uh, buddies in Korea, all helping that cause. Uh, are there any other? Okay, so um, I'm uh, I just want to re-highlight the main ideas because I just don't like. Yeah, the the process of. Saints becoming saints are cool and, and things like that. But I, I always want to re reiterate the things that Mother Teresa taught us. The, the dignity of human life, our commitment to Christ, and uh, how much Jesus loves us. And I wanted to end with this quote, because I think a lot of times we're like, well, 
I can't go to serve the poorest of the poor like Mother Teresa. But holiness does not consist in doing extraordinary things. It consists in accepting with a smile where Jesus sends us. It consists in accepting and following the will of God. And um, it, it's interesting because like uh, Mother Teresa, I mean, I'm a, Saint Teresa of Lisieux, in her little way, a lot of people um, uh, see like doing little things with great love. But the other uh, neat thing about that, which ties into Mother Teresa, is the idea of just uh, accepting what uh, what God has given you. So the same thing with like um, Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Um, accepting one's weaknesses and seeing that as the, the, the place where, where you will grow. Accepting them in, in humility. So um, whatever place you are in life, um, accepting where you, where you are and finding Christ at that moment. Uh, and there's an interesting letter I, I stumbled across of this uh, gentleman writing to Mother Teresa, um, and uh, uh, her response back to him was basically, uh, go out and help those that are lonely, beginning first with your families and your neighbor, and just seeing that, like that, that love that she expressed to the poorest of the poor dying, expressing that was, immediately to those that you're most closest to. Because, I mean, that, I, I struggle with that. I mean, so just finding, just in your immediate family, finding um, um, the great love to express to them and then to your friends and everyone in the community uh, it is very great. Because I think the one time, we, uh, the one thing that we always forget is Christ started with 12, and he just focused on the 12. And they continued his work. So finding those that are most close to you and just loving them. And great things will happen. Um, so...